And then there's volume. So what you're doing is you're getting on this, my clients. And if you want to try this, you're getting on the scale every morning, you are eating at this, in this window, usually two times a day, you pick those times. And then if the scale is not going down for a few days, it's probably you're eating too much. Cause again, you have to create a deficit. How do we maximize this whole idea? Calorie density. One of the perks of a plant-based diet Plants are full of fiber. In fact, the only way you get fiber, the only form of fiber in food, plants. So the great thing about a plant-based diet, another one of the perks of losing weight with a plant-based diet and for all the other reasons is that you're getting the most nutritional bang for your caloric buck. You're getting that satiety. So you're not hungry all the time because of all that fiber in these foods. So you could utilize caloric density to your advantage to stay satiated and, you know, with, with satiation and satiety, they're two different things, the immediate effect and the over how long it lasts. Those are two things. So eating whole plants is ideal. And so I kind of broke this down into another graphic a few years ago. I need my glasses again. The calorie and nutrient density of food changes with the processing, right? So every der derivation away from the original, we're getting rid of fiber. We're getting rid of some of the nutrition. And so we're going to get less satiety. So you want to stick to the intact versions of this, a minimally, most minimally processed foods of all. Now you could argue that you chop into a carrot and it's processed. People get extreme, but that's not really what we're talking about. We're talking about like going from grapes to a raisin, right? Where you're getting rid of the, the um, water and dehydrating it or to the grape juice where you're getting rid of the fiber and you're just taking out the juice. You want to stick to the wholest version possible, which is why I don't have my clients consuming oils, oils, pure fat, totally. You saw the caloric density. It is like, you don't get any satiety from it. You remove all the fiber and most of the nutrition from it. You don't need oil. I also have my clients cut up flour during this time because flour is concentrated. It's refined and it's easier to eat more of it. And it's less satisfying, less satiation for more calorie. That's a lose, lose situation. So during the weight loss process, overall, generally speaking, it's healthier to stick to as whole as possible. And so in my book, I sum this up with um, this. I got a little delay, kind of pause. I don't know if you guys see it yet. Now it's going to skip forward. Okay. Here, how to use um, the caloric density kind of idea in weight loss are these four things. So volumize. So you're plumping up the meals with more veggies, fruits, and mushrooms because they're so low in calories. So like in the book, I have a coleslaw potato salad. So it's like a lot of vegetable and very lower calorie. We have a nice, delicious dressing on top or the tempeh Reuben salad with rye potato croutons and Russian dressing, which is so fabulous, but it's very veggie heavy or the mushroom cabbage cups where it's very veggie mushroom heavy. So that's one way to think about it. You know, you could put, put your meal on a bed of greens over a salad salad with a light vegetable soup, just so you're plumping up your meals, you're volumizing that fiber. The other step is maximizing. So you're making the foods with the low calorie density, the main attraction. So in the books, stuff like my spaghetti squash lasagna, or the peanut butter vegetable curry, or the Tex-Mex stuffed peppers with cheesy sauce, which is what I'm having for lunch as soon as we hang up from here. But making those, those vegetable heavy dishes and mushroom heavy dishes, the main attraction, like stuffed mushrooms. Like there's so many ways to do it and it's delicious and it's satisfying. And then you're just getting lower calorie. Cause again, we have to create a deficit and prioritize. So you're minimizing the foods with a high calorie density. So that would be stuff like, you know, the nuts and seeds, you're limiting one or two ounces a day, 30 to 40 grams a day. And then, you know, tofu, avocado once in a while, those can fit in absolutely, but you're minimizing those because those are a little bit more nutritionally or calorically dense. That's just a way to think about it. And then of course, recognizing. So because of this caloric density, you should start to feel the hunger satiety even more and just like practicing, get to know your body, really tune into your body. You'll be amazed what it'll tell you if you really, really pay attention and try to just get away from all the noise. There's a lot of noise out there. Protein, protein, eat three meals a day, six meals a day, keep your metabolism on fire, all that stuff. Breakfast, lunch, just try to get away from that and go, am I hungry? Am I satiated? And use that in terms of, of, of guiding yourself. And then monotony. Most of us are creatures of habit. Most of us eat the same, like maybe one or two breakfasts, maybe two or three or four lunches, maybe five or six dinners in a week rotation wise. 
most of us have a repertoire of about 10 recipes, which is what I always say. Like I talked about this in my last talk about if you want to switch to a plant-based diet, all you need are your 10 new favorite plant-based recipes. That's it. That's so feasible and doable. It's not a big obstacle to come up with 10 recipes. So with the weight loss process, if you're not making all these crazy food decisions and you're not, you know, having lots of variety where it's exciting and it tastes even better. So you're just, I'm going to have a couple extra bites where it adds up really quickly. This is a really helpful tool for weight loss. So interestingly, have you heard this fact? We make about 200 food decisions a day. What am I going to eat? What am I going to eat? Oh, those M&Ms look really good on my colleague's table at my desk over there. Um, oh, my daughter's eating curry. That looks really good. I want to bite. Should I have a bite? What do I have for lunch? What do I have for dinner? Oh, I wish I didn't eat that. All of those thoughts about 200 a day. It's insane. If you think about how much space we use in our brain to think about this. In fact, I've cleared up space with my club. We clear up space. Like what else do you want to do with your life? If you could save all this time, not making decisions, what else would you do with your time? And I'm not kidding. I've had clients finish their PhD dissertations, learn a new language, start a new instrument, read all these books, clean up their house. I think of all these things that people have done because they're not planning food. They're not thinking about food. They're not eating food all day long. They're not cleaning up and preparing and all the time that we spend making and thinking and doing about food and all the guilt and shame that so many people struggle with. I don't know if all of you can relate to that, but a lot of us relate to guilt and shame associated with eating. If you can get rid of all of that, what would you do with your time? It's an important question because that space and time will be there and you get to fill it. How will you fill it? And it's really important moving forward. A little delay. Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. So monotony and keeping it simple is extraordinarily helpful. You're eating twice a day. You're eating whole food, plant-based. You watch the scale. That's it. Simple, simple meals. The simpler foods are better. We don't need any of these highly processed foods in our diet. Those are for days of deliciousness, which we'll get to later, but like for the day to day eating simple is good. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to get hundred percent RDI. Keep it simple. Eat whole plants. It really is that simple. And I love this quote. It's in my book from Zig Ziglar. Repetition is the mother of learning the father of action, which makes it the architect of accomplishment. Everything about food is habit. All of these things we do around food is habit and socialized into us. Try new habits, create these new habits, tiny little habits that will you repeat day after day after day. It becomes second nature and you get all of the results and it becomes automatized. And that's the goal, right? It's to not have to think about all this stuff anymore to feel really comfortable and enjoy your food. I'm not saying any of that, but just getting it into a pattern and a new habits, and then it will become equally familiar and enjoyable if you, once you're into that pattern. So the next chapter in the book is execute. It's basically that you eat within a time restricted window, usually twice a day, once or twice a day, whatever you prefer. If you need three times a day, that's fine too, or whatever works for you. You eat whole plants and you track the results. If you get on the scale for a couple of days, three, four days, and it's not budging or it's going up, you're eating too much course. Correct. That's it. That's it. There's no secrets here. The secret to weight loss is there's no secrets. And this is just a way to think about it. That's very simple, but really accurate. It doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to be like, you know, like you're not broken. You're not broken. So many people come to me, they think they're broken. They're, you know, postmenopausal or their hormones or their thyroid must be a problem. But you would know if your thyroid is a problem, you could, that's a simple test. And it's usually not the case. You're not broken. It's almost always the food. It's always the food. Whenever I see food journal, I know my client came to me yesterday and she's like, I'm so frustrated and so defeated. I'm like, really? Because I saw your food journal. I knew exactly what was going on. Like you, you will start to recognize that it's always the food. And that's a good thing because that means you're in the driver's seat and you, this, I want to empower you to know that you get to make these decisions. You get to decide your weight. You get to choose your weight. You get to choose your food. You get to choose what's on your plate. We don't get to choose a lot in this world. We don't have control over most things in life, but control what you can control. And your food is one of them. It's, it's quite extraordinarily empowering if you think about it that way. The next chapter is motivate. 
So I use different tools for motivation. Of course, that's what I do. Like, I, you know, all my, all my techniques and everything are in this book. Uh, all I offer when I work with clients and when I teach classes is accountability. And that's the only difference. So I use, you could always use your own accountability. So a food journal is incredible because, you know, when you're about to take a bite, like, do I really want to write that on my food journal? No, I'm not going to eat that. It's not on my plan. I'm not hungry. That's a great accountability tool. The other thing I use is something called emotional to-do lists. These have been so helpful. And this evolved out of conversations over the last decade with my clients when you have a plan and you're eating twice a day and you know what you're eating, I know I'm having my Fiesta cauliflower rice, Tex-Mex pep, Tex peppers with nacho cheese sauce after we hang up. I know what my plan is today. If I were to have said, say, have a bite with my daughter last night with, of her curry, um, I would have been eating. Why am I eating? So all you need to do is take one moment. And before you, well, when you know yourself, right, which is what this, all this whole thing is about is finding out, knowing thyself. When you know that, oh, I'm eating this because I'm stressed, usually it's stress, I'm bored, that's a really common one. Sometimes it's sad and out feeling out of control. Uh, sometimes it's feeling, you know, like you're celebrating with someone, all of those things. So stop yourself and go, what am I doing? What's going on? Really, what's going on? Because food is not going to solve that problem. Food will solve hunger, it will solve nourishment, but it's not going to solve any of those problems. It just pushes it down. And this is where I get into the nuts and bolts with my clients about what's really going on, but deep dive into it and ask yourself. And if those are the most common ones, so here's what I have my clients do before those moments hit, write a list and I keep them. I like putting it in my phone, like in the notes section, because you could bring it with you and keep ongoing exhaustive lists of for stress. It would be things I do that relax me. So for me, it's taking a hot bath or going out into nature for a minute or cuddling with a, a fuzzy animal or calling my girlfriend or, you know, hugging my daughter or whatever it is for you, write it down, type it out, have it in front of you. So that when it's that moment, when you're about to eat and you're like, you just have to stop yourself. You do, I have my client set a timer for one minute, just give yourself space, that mindful moment, give yourself time to be mindful and say, am I, what am I doing? Am I hungry? Does the celery stick sound good? No. Okay. What's going on? Stress. Okay. Go into your list and promise yourself. You're going to do one of those things on your list. First, you could always eat later. And I'm going to go hug my daughter. Boom. Go hug your daughter. Come back down. Am I still hungry? No. It's just a way to give yourself space and a, mo a moment of mindfulness before you do something. So that's what I have my clients do. It's so helpful. And then you keep adding to your list. Like if you know, you're know you walking around going, oh, this is really relaxing. I'm going to add that to my stress list. And then have a separate list for entertainment. When I'm bored, I love to binge watch a show on Netflix or, you know, read a juicy novel or dive into that, you know, practice my, I'm studying Spanish on Duolingo, whatever it is, like put those things in a list also. So that when you're like, Oh, I'm just actually bored. What can I do? That will be entertaining. It's really helpful. It sounds a little silly, but again, words are so powerful and having it written is visceral. And if you can create that space and create something to do, give yourself a to do, it will put you in the right direction. And the last little motivational thing that I use with my clients is called sticky notes. Basically I have them write down the sayings that really motivate them. Like don't break the seal or nothing tastes as good as healthy feels. And you put that down. I have my client, they stick them on their computer or by their fridge or in their car or by their phone, wherever it is. And it's just reminders because again, you know, we just need to keep thinking about it and being present in the moment. And that's one way to keep you present. All right. So you've gone to your goal weight. Hallelujah. You're finally done with weight loss. Now what? Well, now is when the diet actually begins. This is the most crucial, crucial time. The reason my subtitle is lose weight for the last time is because I want to break that roller coaster. This is like right now at that bottom weight, you are a spring stretched out to maximum capacity and your body is brilliant at homeostasis. So it wants to go back. It wants to go back to old habits. It wants to go back to that weight. You need to be so, so determined right now. This is the most important point, point ever of this whole process. Maintenance mode is the most important part. So here's what I do with my clients when we start going into that. I have them go try to stay at that same weight for as many days in a row. So you're going to like get your body. It's kind of like a set point theory type of idea where you're getting your body homeostasis sized. I know it's not a word uh, at this new weight. Okay. And then we set boundaries. So I know that I love when I feel the best and my clothes fit best when I'm about 115 to 120. 
for my, my weight. So if I get to 123 or maybe 122, I rein it back in. I'm like, okay, a couple of days where I have to be like, you know, I have to rein it in and that's okay. I just do it for a couple of days. Like those naturally lean people here, we employ that, that, that phenomenon again. It's just, you rein it back in and you have a no matter what weight. And it's a boundary. So if you keep getting on the scale, which is another boundary I recommend because some people say, oh, I ate off plan like this weekend is a bunch of holidays right now. Um, And so if you eat off plan, it's like, oh, I'll just get on scale on Monday or I'll just get on scale next week or next month or January. And that's where the problem's happening because it's like, la, 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 I don't want to look, I don't want to see, I don't want to hear. And that's how you end up just getting back into your old habits. So be accountable to yourself, get on the scale every day and set that boundary, have a no matter what weight. The way I start bringing in maintenance mode with my clients is we bring back more movement, a little bit more exercise. That's going to increase your appetite a little bit. Great. Then you're going to increase your intake a little bit, but you'll see that the more more days you're at that weight, the more you can get away with because your body's used to it. Like most of us know how to maintain. Like I've been around the same weight my entire life, except for my pregnancies. So I'm really good at maintaining. And I, you know, most of us are like, even if you're like 30 pounds above where you want to be, you've probably been really easy, easily staying at that 30 pounds. It's not like you gain, 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 gain all the time. Most of us are very good at maintenance. So remember, there's a lot more wiggle room in maintenance mode, but at first you have to be very, very diligent about it. So I bring back movement and activity. I bring back a little bit more variety with the food, because remember more variety means you want to eat more, more decisions about food. The more, the more we eat, that's just human nature as well. Another tool for maintenance is a gratitude list. This also evolved out of conversations with my clients. And I interviewed Devon Franklin on my podcast. And one of his things that he did once was um, do a 30, put a timer on for 30 seconds and just say out loud everything you're grateful for. So I thought before I interviewed him, I'm like, I'm going to try this. Why not? So I was sitting there in the morning. I was making my, I was sitting right back there. And I'm like, I set the timer and I was like, Oh, I'm excited that I'm grateful that I get to choose between tea and coffee this morning. I'm grateful for my fuzzy slippers. I'm grateful for blah, blah, blah. And I just started doing it. I just started listing up silly things, big things. I'm grateful for my health. I'm grateful for my kids, whatever serious little tiny. And I realized that after that timer stopped, the gratitude kept going. I kept thinking about all that stuff. So my clients that have had extraordinarily, you know, amazing results throughout the, and, and awarenesses and epiphanies and, and ideas and like new things that they haven't done in a long time, sometimes decades, write it down again, words are powerful. So, so powerful. So I have them keep a list of gratitude, things they're grateful for. It's a really great thing. Why not? You know, gratitude is something we don't focus enough on and we focus on what we focus on. So if you make yourself focus on things that you want to focus on, it's creating barriers and boundaries and space in your brain for that. It's going to allocate that real estate in your brain for focusing on those things. So why not focus on gratitude and you'll be more grateful in the world. And the last thing about uh, maintenance is days of deliciousness. So I don't like to call anything cheat days because first of all, I want you to love your food. Like don't need food. You don't love. You don't have to live on carrot sticks. Like that's just boring. You, know, you need to enjoy your food. And there are so many things you can enjoy eating this way. You don't need a cheat day. You're only cheating yourself, right? That whole old statement, but basically a day of deliciousness is perhaps a day you want to be a little bit more decadent. So if it's a holiday or if it's your birthday, if you're going to be with your daughter, you haven't been with in a long time or whatever it is, like it's something special, then plan it and then enjoy every single bite of it. No guilt or shame or anything. You're just going to enjoy it knowing that right after that, you're going to get back on plan. There is wiggle room. There is room for this in your life. We have to live. We are human. Life is short and we have to enjoy our life and food is part of that, but I want you to enjoy all your food. And then some days you have a day of deliciousness. And so here's what that looks like. Oh, here's my beautiful daughter who I've been talking about all day long. Hello, honey. Happy spring break. Are you leaving? I love you. I put them over there. Say hello. <laughs> Happy spring break. I love you. Drive safe. Um, okay. So here are all of the foods that you can eat deliciously. I mean, just, uh, just an example of it. I have a list, um, somewhere. Let me see if I could pull up my list. Okay. Let's see if I can find my list of foods. It's so fun to think about it like this. I said it last time. Okay. So here we go on a plant-based diet. There's no limit, right? You could eat pots, pans, plates, power bowls. Those are the chapters in this book. And then soup, salad, sides, and sweets, the chapters of my last book, stews, stir fry, stacks, scrambles, skewers, sushi, sauces, sautés, sheep pans, slaws, steaks, stuffed veggies, chilies, chowders, casseroles, curries, lasagna, loaded potatoes, 
loaves, pastas, panini, paellas, pancakes, pilafs, pizza, polenta, pestos, puddings, potstickers, purees, bisques, bakes, barbecue, biryani, burritos, burgers, hummus, dips, dressings, wraps, rolls, ramen, risottos, roasts, tacos, tostadas, toast, tofu, tempeh, trail mix, tarts, tagine, dumplings, fajitas, masalas, kebabs, quiches, wings, ratatouilles, and so much more. What would you add to that list? There's so much deliciousness on a plant-based diet. And I mean, during the weight loss phase and during maintenance phase and forever on out on a plant-based diet, it is full of delicious options. (laughs) 